Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another edition of the Big East Rewind. I am Chuck Everson, your seven-foot host from Villanova University, and my partner is the Cavity Cape Crusader, my main man, Dr. Sonny Sparrow. How are you, Sonny? I'm great, Chuck. I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I am very excited to have this guest on with us today. He's one of the guys that when I go to games and stuff, he's a he's a Villanova guy, first of all, and a Villanova big uh, Sonny. So you're outnumbered. I was waiting. I was waiting one. for it. I you're outnumbered. I'm sorry. It. You know, it's a double whammy for you, Sonny. I apologize. But, uh, you know, he's one of the guys that I hang out with when uh, I come to games and stuff. And he's uh, between him and Daniel Oshefu, it's funny because one Steph. of them, one one of them is twenty years younger than me, and the other one is thirty years younger than me. <laughs> but it, it's all good because uh, we all wore the same jersey, and uh, it, it's a lot of fun. And this guy uh, is one of my favorite alums uh, that we get to hang out with when I go to events and stuff. So, without any further ado, Sonny. Our guest today, one of his teammates describes him, actually a lot of his teammates that I talked to, but one in particular describes him as the ultimate Villanova basketball player, which is oh, saying wow. we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Yeah, we talked uh, about it, but yeah. Yeah, we're gonna talk about it. he played between 2003 and 2007. He was one of the cornerstones for the culture that was built under Jay Wright, one of one of the first uh, second recruiting class, I think, of Jay's uh tenure. Um, he was and is a renaissance guy, Sonny. He's ahead of his time. With a, He was a writer, journalist, entertainer, rapper, and MC, the state of Delaware Basketball Hall of Famer, and the Villanova 2023-2024 <laughs> Nova Alumni of the Year. I hear <laughs> Delaware's own, my main man, Will Bump Sheridan. How are you, Will? I'm great. Thank you for having me, Sonny. Chuck, what's going on? Not much, great, my man. Great Not to much. Have you. Always I, good to I've, see you, Will. I've only heard stories from Chuck about, you know, this younger generation and getting to know some of these younger guys and us old gray-haired guys. We appreciate you guys giving us a little bit of a little bit of space and a little bit of respect. So good to have you on. Yeah, yeah well, thanks. I appreciate it. Will's one of those guys, man. I mean, you know, and and on beside all of that, and Will knows this, besides all of that, my son, CJ, who you know, Sonny, Will was his favorite player, Will and Mike Nardi. So they were up, and, and coincidentally, Mike and Will were roommates at Villanova. So that was during his time when he grew up watching the Cats. And you know what's cool about the whole thing? And we talk about the Nova family, and I understand that sometimes that can get a little... Uh, crazy for people who don't really know uh, what's what, right? But, um, you know, CJ was out with his girlfriend one night and and Will was working at this establishment and uh, walks by him in the street. Will calls him over. And the next thing you know, they're having a couple of adult beverages, at, you know, together. <laughs> so it, it's it's all good, Sonny. It doesn't matter when you played there. It's if it's just that you have the same uniform. We had the same type of experiences, and that's what it's all about, Sonny. You know, I try to facilitate it. the fun. But uh, yeah. Sonny, don't fret. I have lots of connections to Syracuse. If you can remember back, I was on the Tim Thomas players. Shout out to Tim Thomas, great alumni of Illinois. Yeah. I played on his uh, AU team, and three of my teammates went to Syracuse. Uh, Daryl Watkins, which we called Mookie back then. Yeah. Uh, Demetrius Nichols and Terrence Roberts. Imagine those three with me on one team with four other stars. And J.R. Smith was on our team. But uh, those are Syracuse guys and high school Sanford basketball is a great tradition of a uh, Delaware high school basketball and Trevor Cooney Trevor. went to Syracuse, Syracuse and I think he won a national championship. Yeah. Before that, um, I think I was, the, I had got the furthest along as a uh, Delaware basketball player in the NCAA tournament. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. And fun fact about my man, Will here, Sonny, he wears the number 50. Do you know why he wears the number 50? I do well, because you guess. and I talked about guess. it. We, we, we <laughs> talked about it. So, do you want me to say it? Want no, say I'll, it I'll say it. His, his his parents were both in law enforcement, Fibo, 
So as a nod to mom and dad, he wore the number 50, which I thought was pretty cool. When I heard that, I was like, wow, that's, I didn't realize that that's why you wore that number. That's good. Definitely, definitely why. What was that, I, uh, what was that like growing up with two parents that were in law enforcement, man? I mean, were they strict with you guys at, at home or? I was my parent, my, my two parents, only child. I have siblings by my father as well. Right. But I, I think my parents were strict, but they were always on shift work. So I just know how to meet people where they are, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's true. That's true. That's true. For sure. Did you ever get um, denied like any invitations to parties because maybe mom or dad might find out or pick you up? You know, I wasn't really a partier until after college, but then I heard stories in high school that I might be a narc or something. I didn't even know what a narc was <laughs> in high school. Um, so you were, yeah, you were, like just you were twenty one Jump Street. You didn't know. Yeah, man. That's you know. Well, when you have. Yeah, I, go yeah, ahead. I think. Um, I think being able to relate to people is one of my strengths, and like just like who at the core of who I am. I try to meet people where they are, but just for all of the people listening out there, we're going to talk about intersectionality a lot. So yeah. ding, 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 look up intersectionality, <laughs> all these things that make me relate to all these other people. That's one of them. Right. Uh, my parents were both police officers and get this. My uncle, Joe Bryant was, um, he was the just, just below chief of police. And he was the first black person to be that for the Newcastle County Police Department. How about so, that? My whole family. I grew up with two police cars um in front of my house every day. Wow. Well, I used to get dropped off in a police car. So so what part of Delaware are you from? From Bear, Bear Delaware. So Bear, talk Delaware. talk about that for a second. What was it like growing up in Bear, Delaware? Oh man. So Bear was um a booming kind of suburb that was um just coming about in the 90s when we moved there. I feel like I was born in 85. We might have moved there in like 90, 91. And um, I went to school in Wilmington, Delaware at a Catholic school, St. Peter's Cathedral, but lived in Bear. So the kids in my neighborhood were like, we don't know you. And the kids at school were like, right. we don't know you. So I was always kind of an outsider, but um, I don't know. I just, and an only child. So I think growing up in Bear, small was, um, was the right environment it was nurturing it was I felt at home you know I never felt unsafe all those things little did I know everyone I was playing against with in summer leagues growing up when I first started playing basketball I thought I was a spoiled brat but a silver spoon huh. and I was doing my own demons you know wow wow so you have, you know, okay, so you're, you're an only child of your mom and dad, right? And, you know, you're, you're growing up and you're playing. Who, where did you find the love of the game? How did you get involved with this great game that uh, the three of us love so much? So I'm very proud to say that I love basketball. I love the game. Um, I will admit, though, I did not love the game until after I stopped playing. Um, it probably was maybe 2012 when I started watching the NBA every day. So growing up, I didn't yeah. watch basketball. I really resented uh, the way my father would scream at the t television. So I wasn't a <laughs> basketball fan. And I used really? to like only do research so that when people interview me or ask me who my inspirations were, um, I would lie, right? I would say Dennis Rob. I would say, uh, sorry, I would say Dennis Rodman and David Robinson because they seemed like the best mix of what I wanted my game to be. Right. what people wanted my game to be um yeah yeah it would get to the point chuck where um coach would reference players mm -hmm. when i was playing at nova and i had no idea who he was talking about <laughs> he was like you're like the haslam of our team and i'm like i don't know who that is that's terrible you shake your that's, head yes <laughs> that's really terrible so i now that you know years of self-work i think um what really got me about the game was connecting with others, being on the road. And this is at a very young age. I started playing basketball, and then all of a sudden I was on an AAU team. I was on five AAU teams. I was away every weekend. It was having that brotherhood, that connection to these people that no matter who you are or what you are, like on the court, if you're getting it, if you're getting it done, then yeah. they respect you and love you and will protect you. So 
that's what made me love the game. And it really basketball, the actual game of it, it, um, it took for, it took, it took some time for me to really love everything about it. And now I love the culture. I love the game. I know the game. I'm a student of sure. the game. I can talk to it. I can talk from an informed place, but again, I was a sheltered child. I had a six inch growth spur. I went from five, eight at the beginning, sixth grade, sixth grade to six, three after oh, Christmas wow. break and sixth grade is when I really started playing. I mean, you know, so were you like, was, you were like yeah, the big kid that they said, okay, you want to try this? Let's see how good you are at this. Will is that, no, is that kind no, of how no, that no, went? No, no, no. I don't know where you guys are from, but I'm from Wilmington, Delaware. If you are five, eight, in sixth grade, you're a big man. <laughs> and if you suck and have no reference of basketball, then you're soft. And <laughs> you're going to fight after every game that you lose right. until you start winning. So they just toughen you up a little bit. And, um, man, I went to war. I would I would say that um, shout out to Earl Miller or the Miller family. He was His dad was my middle school coach. And... I, I told him to this day, and I said it in my Delaware Hall of Fame speech, that he bullied me into playing basketball, really. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the same group of 11 kids in middle school that were just like on my neck. And then, I mean, imagine getting dropped off in a police car every day in Wilmington, <laughs> Delaware. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So yeah. Well, uh, that was a, that was a strike against you right away. Yeah. Right, you, you know. So, um, yeah. So those guys that uh, I hated so much became my teammates, and they taught me how to persevere, overcome adversity, deal with adversity, stand up for myself. Right. Like all those little things that you need at the core of who you are, and I got it from that. And then comes along Art Bowers, who's a seventh grader who transferred to my middle school and could dunk. He was six three and could dunk. And I was like six five, six four in seventh grade and couldn't dunk. And he he just pushed me to be so much better because he was so much more uh, a student of the game early on. Mm -hmm. And um after that, like, you know, once I got my spot, you know, nobody could stop me, honestly. Like Nobody was F with me, right? Two-time yeah. Gatorade player of the year. Only time that ever happened. Only other person that would have did that would have probably been Nana for the state of Delaware. But I think the COVID year, they gave it as a, I don't know. I was looking it up. I was trying to give a shout out to Nana, whom I love. Um, but yeah, Delaware player of the year, Gatorade player of the year, um, twice. Sorry, Gatorade player of the year twice. The papers gave it to uh, Mark Everson, who went to oh. Georgetown. Okay. I remember him. So, yeah. So, so where did you find, I mean, you talked about that's your teammate. Where did you find competition to really take your game up a level? Right. You talked a little bit of your AAU team, which is yeah. stack. That's a stack AAU team, but who are you playing against? Are you going to Philly? Are you playing close by Wilmington had good ball? Where was, where was your, where was your uh, chops? Where'd you get your chops? Sonny, that's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, First and foremost, I was never a five until I played at Villanova University, right? I was a four. So there was Joe Dyson who came to my middle school. He was always two or three inches taller than me. He played the five, right? That's middle school. Then he came into my high school. So I always played the four until I got to Villanova. But um, yeah, so middle school, I played in uh, the Boys and Girls Club League, Jackson Street Boys Club in Wilmington, Delaware and CYO. And then... From there, the first team I ever played on that was the AU team, I think was Sal's Express, was the Salvation Army team. So I played on five teams at once Salvation Army, Sal's Express, Delaware Sharpshooter. Shout out to Dwayne Coverdale because he was the first person to ever take me to Villanova game and say that you're going to play here. And I was like, wow, I was thinking about this interview and I was like, man, that, that's important. Dwayne Coverdale really was like, you're going to Villanova. I was like, I was like, whoa, I just <laughs> yeah. started playing basketball yesterday. I couldn't even make a layup. I used to average like 20 rebounds and 10 points because I was taller than everybody else, right? right. So South Express, Delaware Sharpshooters, um, and I played for UPenn graduate um, Randy Ekman, who Phil Ekman is one of my teammates in high school. We won in 2002. He also is my dentist. You can see, guys, I'm, I have a little <laughs> surgery. Um, 
And um, the, we played on this team called Uville Cougars, right? So then Uville Cougars, Unionville, Pennsylvania. So I played on three teams. Unionville played against Tim Thomas, right? And okay. I roasted them, but we lost by like 20. I like had like 30. I was bringing a ball up, shooting threes. And, then, and Jim Salmon was like, yo, do you want to come do this for real? And I was like, yes. And it was a wrap. I started playing for the Tim Thomas players, and I never played for any other team. Wow. Again, I said I played for five teams, Geneville Cougars, South Express, Delaware Sharpshooters, Tim Thomas players. Oh, um, Championship Sports. So Chester okay. High. So that was that was right behind Jameer Nelson's uh, run in Chester, and that they had built up that infrastructure. I remember um, 14, 15-year-old Nationals. We, we, I didn't, but the team drove down and – and vans, man, they had us six in a room. Oh. That was the trenches. That was before NIL yeah. in middle school. <laughs> yeah, right. You're not kidding. You're not kidding. So Tim sponsored that team that you were on then. He ran the uh, – he sponsored he that the team. Right? And it was Adidas sponsored. So oh, wow. Um, yeah, Adidas everything. So back to your question, Sonny. Sonny Vaccaro, right, is Adidas. Mm -hmm. But also I played in – um. Sunny Hill League. You like how I did that? You like that's a good, that? yeah, that's pretty good. I saw it. <laughs> Sunny Hill good. League was your DJ skills. There's your segue. That's yeah, the Sunny Hill, the guys. Sunny Hill League. Tell people that don't iconic, iconic, unbelievable. Yeah, iconic. Um, anybody who's anybody from the Philadelphia area traveled to play at Temple on the floor. Yep, and get either get roasted or roast, and that's oh, yeah. what it was. I wasn't even ready, honestly, when I went. So I was, I yeah. was like, <laughs> and they were like, and you never knew who was going to show up. Like I played in a couple games there. Charles Barkley rolls in, and Joe Bryant rolls in, and we there was a bunch of guys that had just gotten drafted against guys that were in the league, and, and, and places it. packed. It was kind of like now I've never played at the Rucker, but it's like that in that everybody's right on top of you, and it's always mobbed, right? Yeah, so I was going there in, in high school, and then in college, they're like, oh, you're going to play here and at the shore on in the summertime. Yeah, the I'm shore like, league was okay. good, too. And I thought, yeah, okay, well, I, I've already played in the Sunny Hill League, and I get there, and then pros start showing up. I was like, oh, this yeah. is serious. <laughs> so, yeah, like you yeah. said, it was like the rucker. Yeah, But, man. yeah, I, I just always play – I always stepped out of my comfort zone. I was never uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. I was very comfortable with adversity or change or and I just wanted to get out. I had right. seen I had the thing about Delaware is that we have no major sports. If unless you really do the research, you don't have any inspiration or role models to look up to, at least back then. You know, we didn't right. have DiVincenzo. I was just gonna Bones, say you don't have he didn't have Dante Bones, back then. All those guys. Belladonna. That, yeah. So so um, you really needed something to get you out. And I just saw the opportunity to get out and I knew I needed to get out. And I'm happy to say that I'm back now. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So talk talk a minute about your recruitment. I know I know you had, I, I saw a, uh, an, an interview that you did. And, you know, unfortunately for Sonny and his orange men, they would have, they were ranked right out of the picture, right? Because of the color of the jerseys, right? Is that the deal? Because I heard you Use say, the cues I heard, I heard you say you were not going to wear an orange. Is that true? No orange, no purple, no green. <laughs> what was that? Was so, that was how I thought? Like, that I was mean, your, that was your color wheel, so. right? <laughs> <laughs> that is a, a proper reflection and a, and a very accurate observation. Um, Again, I was I was who I am, and yeah, you know, I was the okay. young Will. So, so you wind up at Villanova. So now, for for people that don't know, Will, you mm -hmm. you were you went to Villanova, and you know, and you were gay at the time. You're still gay, right? And, Wait, I was I'm gay. Yes, and and oh my God. and you famously came out. My mom is going to see this, Chuck. Don't tell people. I'm, I'm gay. sorry. No, I'm <laughs> but listen, I you know, talk about. That whole experience coming into, you know, a group, in, you know, in a locker room setting and in a team setting like that, 
because I think it's fascinating because I I know the story, you know, and um, you know, I thought it was awesome how your teammates kind of looked out for you and protected yeah. you in some ways. Um, you know, so so talk, let's get into that. Talk about that whole scenario yeah. when you went there and well, first and foremost, like, um I have two very conservative parents. Um, but they also instilled in me self-esteem, esteem of self good about who I was and trusted my own judgment and knew I wasn't going to go too far left or right beyond what was aligned with who I really am. Yeah. So I just knew my character would shine through. Second part there is that I've always felt alone, right? So I wanted brothers and I knew with my actions and my behavior and consistency, I could establish relationships that would last forever. Yeah. And I've always been super cerebral. And so I'm overthinking everything before it even happens. Right. Um, so I got to Nova. And slowly but surely, I mean, I told Mike, what, the first, I don't know, a couple of days living together. And it just slowly over three or four years, telling my teammates whenever it felt right. But they had already known because after freshman year, I, I was dating a girl for about six months and she was like, I was like, <laughs> and it just was, you know, like there's not, it wasn't right. So, um, yeah. and then I was dating somebody at Penn Law. So we would all go out in Philly or I would go separate and see them in Center City. And I'm like, oh, I'm going over here and you're going over there. And like, they're like, right. mm -hmm. so, and then the Palestra was crazy and any other Philadelphia school was crazy, but. Well, Philly's crazy in general though. Well, I mean, you know, it, the, and and they're ruthless with some of the signs and some of the other shit that and they I do. love it because I want people yeah. to hate me with their chests. Everybody right. out there, if you're a hater, happy pride. Anyway, <laughs> um, with that said, when I got there, I felt like um, I had already known all these guys, right? From playing for right. Jim Thomas, I played with Jason, I played against Curtis, I played against Allen, I played against Randy, right. I played against Newark Pams with uh, Newark, I mean, with Nardi. Um, yeah. That's the Newark Rams. We called them the Newark Rams. But um, so I felt like I, these guys were my competition and they respected me as a competitor. And what I did, I did well. So I just knew if I went out there and played solid, then they had no choice, right? And we were in the trenches. I don't know if you know, we had the number one recruiting. I know you know, Chuck, but Sonny, <laughs> number one recruiting class in the world comes in. I'm supposed to play the five. We got all McDonald's right. All-American five. We got a one, a two, a three, a four, me and Nardi come in and we had phone call, phone card scandals, right? Like, so they had like something where they were using this code to call out of their rooms and all the athletes had it. And they had to, they had to make an example of the basketball players. Right. So my first five games, it was at temp, it was verse temple at, somewhere it wasn't the leader core center it was somewhere else i i um, thought it was i thought it was at their arena because that that game was like at midnight or something right it was that, at their arena but it doesn't look it don't, i don't remember it the way that i see it when i'm sitting there so maybe it was just new or the only reason had, i say that is we had an alumni game prior to that game that i played in um and the reason i wanted to play it is because mitchell and ness sponsored it so i got my own throwback jersey which oh, doesn't it's Fire. one of one. It's one of one. Well, you know, so. Fire. And yeah, the funny thing about it. it, the funny thing about it was I get to the hotel to eat pregame meal with Eddie. And uh, so we're eating a pay and I look at the paper and they have the roster and they have Everson 43, which is Wyatt Maker's number. I went, no way. Because oh, they, no. they would just call us the two big kids. They wouldn't even differentiate, you know, left and right, you know. So, um so what happens, I get there and it's got my name on it and why it's number on it on the mm -hmm. on the jersey. Mm -hmm. But we got this that is why there. this is why visibility is important. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> so, so, so I'm gonna go back for a second. So wait, wait, I wasn't done. So no, go ahead. Sorry, and I'll be I'll be right. No, you're good. In a you're good. I'm, you're I'm good. Loquacious. I talk a lot. So right. hold All on. Good. Um first five games. We have suspensions. We have to play Temple at midnight. Then we fly, play Redlands, which I think is D2. 
I they're think subbing five and five eight five out yeah. i don't know somebody fact check me i might still have the record for freshman rebounds with that game okay. um so then we fly we we beat temple beat redlands by like five points and quadruple overtime with three scholarship players it's me nardi ross condon baker dunleavy and um mikey claxton right and like a couple other people mixed in here and there we fly to hawaii lose the chaminade coach Wright is losing his stuff right so we yep. have time to worry about will sheridan's sexuality bumps bump is gay like we were trying to figure it out in real right. time under pressure and i understood that right i knew my thing wasn't bigger than this thing and i wanted to be part of something bigger than myself so actually it was like a distraction right like that yeah. adversity and building who we were as a team and as a program and i think that's why my teammates when we did find success and things started to come together about who i was and my identity it didn't matter because we had already went right. through it we had already been in it together they were legitimately my family so thank you so where did so the let nickname, me finish that chart <laughs> where did the nickname bump come from okay so <laughs> I had a lot of energy. I'm a I'm an energy guy. Um, and my mom says when I was inside of her, I just used to always be moving. People love to say like I probably was dancing now. It's like a slight to me because I'm very secure with who I am and I can dance for a six eight three hundred pound person. Um, so I was always <laughs> moving around, and so I was bumper. And then when I got bigger, um, it just didn't make sense to call me bumper, so they called me bump. Um, and my grandmother used to say, uh, bump city, bump city. And he used to make me smile as a child. So, and the paper just ran with it bump, but everybody yeah. in Delaware has like a, like a, you know, well, not everybody, but most players have a nickname. I mean, we got smooth and silk rest in peace to silk. Um, you got Cooley and all these people. Right. Well, it seems like Jay always had nicknames for his guys. Yeah. Maybe he just had guys with personality that wanted to be there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let me ask you now, you, you decide you got to tell Mike, Mike's your, Mike's your roommate. You guys were in, you know, and what was Mike's reaction to telling him about yourself? And, and then from there, how did that play out with the, and I know you went, you, you went individually as you got to know the guys and as you got close with people, you didn't come out and have a team meeting and say, oh, right, okay. right, right. You know? So um, talk about that for a second, because I'm, I'm very curious because I, like I said, at the beginning of the show, I, I was, you know, from knowing what I know about your story. Okay. And I, and I don't know as much as I think probably, but knowing what I know about your story, I was so proud of the way the, our guys handled that whole thing. Even to this day, because you talk to, I talked to Curtis, I talked to Mike, I talked to some of the other guys that played with you, and and it's it's exactly what you just said. It was all family, and it's family business, and it's nobody else's business, and that's kind of how they handled it, right? Right. Um, the thing is, if anything did bad, if anything bad did happen, we we had so many great times that it overshadowed it. And also, like you said, it's family business. You would never know. No one would ever know, right? Because yeah. I've since squashed anything that anyone ever made me feel anyway, like by having a yeah. conversation as adults. And now as adults, we look back and we're like, wow, we were such young and immature people. Yeah. But um, freshman year, move in. I'm like, oh yeah, you can use my laptop, but I'm just letting you know. And you got to mind you, this is 2003, right? So it's not like our yeah. phones, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, there's stuff on my computer that's not for you. Just letting you know. Like, he was like, and he was like, basically, Nardi just said, like, you know, as long as you're not doing some weird stuff, like, with my clothes, when I take them off or something weird, <laughs> like, yeah, then we good. But I feel, you know, I had, I was, I was unbelievably confident as a child. Yeah. Um, I knew who I was, but then I tried really 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 hard to be straight because it was yeah. the right thing to do and there was just no images that's why visibility is important also happy yeah. pride month to all my haters thank you appreciate you love you keep hating um but no what it was is is that um it was just respect right i had boundaries creating boundaries communicating and we were doing this without like 
DEI classes or anything like that. We just yeah, we're yeah. human beings. He comes from a great family with great people, Sheila, all you know, Scott. And I just, it was a character evaluation. And I was just like, listen, we will work better together if we're on the same page. And I think that really helped our relationship because from day one, he knew what it was, right? And he got to see me grow. This is the same guy that was like, I remember being in college, you're 19 years old, right? Yeah. Um, after the first six months of having a girlfriend, I was like, bro, like I'm never gonna get laid. Like, there's no like people there. How am I gonna meet anyone? Right. And he's like, Maybe you should dress more gay. <laughs> and we <laughs> both like we both sat there and thought, like, how yeah, like he's just talking to you the way you would talk to anybody. Like, that's something right. You know. Like, how can I yeah. So like, it was just very human 19 year old conversation, right? Like wow. trying to help me out. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was but all in my head. Wild. Yeah. But that's, that's the amazing part. 18, 19, 20 year olds. I, I, I don't know if in the year 2003, you know, are really that well equipped to have those conversations. Right. So you had to have some, some awkward conversation or awkward moments. We'll say, as you're discussing and and causing a person to kind of reflect on their own opinions and had to be like really life altering for a lot of people, I would imagine in the basketball world. Yeah. That's a great point. I think. Yeah. I mean, there was a rumor that um, a Philadelphia legend told Jay Wright not to bring me to Villanova because I was a little, <laughs> so we're going to let that sit there with that. But uh, yeah, you know, respect to that person i don't know it 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 was way before it's it was it was way ahead of his time um it wasn't easy but if anybody could take that weight it's your boy yeah, like yeah, you know right. like i got i get I that got, i got my mother right was born in 59 to a white mom and a black dad before desegregation in southbridge wow delaware like like low income and housing. I had three grandmoms growing up. I didn't even know that my mom's black mom was the woman that had to take her to middle school because desegregation hadn't happened. So if anyone created a pedigree for a pioneer trailblazer, yeah, it was yeah, me, it's you. right? And yeah. I live in that truth now, right? It wasn't always easy. I had to do what I had to do to survive. I encourage young people to do what they need to do to survive and be safe. But I, I really did put in effort to play the part. And once I stopped trying to play this part or this role that was assigned to me in life, I started playing my role better with yeah. everything that was given to me. You got to think like I came out to my parents after freshman year. I feel like I was secure. I, well, I did it before, but they didn't believe me, whatever. But <laughs> they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a phase. Yeah, right. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so I after- wasn't too receptive, though, right? Of that whole yeah, thing. my dad, my dad is, as he would say, old school. Yeah. You know, his peers were who they were. His conversation circles were what they were. Yeah. And um, you know, it's interesting. Genetically, I have an older sister that's not my mom's. That is a lesbian too. So. I used to like yeah. love. I used to give him a little dig there. I used to be like. Uh, I'm sure that <laughs> went over well. Your well. Fault. You know me, like I'm not, what am I afraid of? So my dad used to just, I was like an anomaly, right? I'm like an alpha male and queer, played basketball. It was just like, yeah, this man never seen anything like this. So I can't hold him accountable for not having precedence on how to handle a a monster like me. (laughs) So rest in peace to Big Will. Yeah. A good dad. So, um, how, yeah. How much did like stereotypes, you know, get into you? Like, you know, a gay man is looked at as weak and, you know, that kind of thing. But that didn't reflect in your game at all. I mean, you were a beast inside. You played hard. You got after it. Um, you got into it with people. You know, was that you trying to act a role or was that you? way you play and and how you are 
Well, like I told you, I, I grew up playing in Bear and in right. Wilmington and in these leagues with these people that this is all they have. I don't know if you know, but what I was trying to explain is that there's no professional sports, right? So right. we have UD, rest, uh, love UD, yep. but and Dell State, Stan Waterman's there now. I love yep. Dell State. We got connections to UD and all that. But like high school basketball, like if you don't win, you're fighting, right? So right. like when I got to the Big East, I was... I was you were ready. already like, fighting. What's yeah, up? right. Like, exactly. I'm not a tough guy. I'm not a tough guy. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna take care of me and mine, right? Always, right. right? And I think that's what my teammates connected to: New York, New Jersey, you know, specifically Brooklyn, Strong Island, um, and Bear Delaware. <laughs> so, like, what was I gonna yeah. do? Be the weak link? Not me. Well, I get it. And now, part of what I think people, as far as the stereotypes to your question. People think, um, you know, weak. I'm a total empath, right? So if you ever watch me play, I'm I'm making sure everybody's good, right? I'm going yeah. all the way across the court to take a charge because I'm giving it up for my teammates because I feel all of this. So yeah, that yeah. was that was I, I was a super empath. So that helped me. Now I will say, if I was my authentic self back then, like who I am now, yeah. And like, just not thinking about that side of thing. I used to have dreams, like nightmares every night of like a big scandal or blah, 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 blah. And we were yeah. the phone call thing. I just, if I wasn't, if I didn't have that kind of on my shoulder, I think I would have been more free to be like a better player. And now I find that I get when, it. I, can yeah. I, when I compete now, I'm, I'm more free of a player. And I think that's, you know, again, visibility is important. Yeah. Well, and, talk, and, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sonny. Well, I mean, they talk about like y- your environment and, 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 and let's say you're a smoker right? and smoking generally is bad. But if you're in a group of people who all smoke, actually, the person who doesn't smoke feels pressure and peer pressure, et cetera. So it, it, t- take whatever example you want. But in your situation, the sexuality issue you are unique in this scenario that you're in and it would seem like you feel like everyone around you is different. How did you handle what, cause you talked a little bit already about the pressure that you felt like was on your shoulder. How did you feel about that traveling, playing in other arenas? I know your teammates had your back, but how did you feel about that? I've always been an outsider and not by choice, being an only child, growing up in Bear, right. living in yeah, Wilmington, yeah, yeah. two cop parents, white grandma, I'm black as could be, like all these things, right, make up my pedigree and who I am as a person. And like I said, we were in the trenches, so I was really not focused on me. If you look back, Sports Illustrated did a, a photo shoot on the team. And it was Jay Frey, Curtis Sumter, Kyle Lowry, Mike Nardi, Curtis Sumter, Alan Ray, um, Randy Foy, and who's missing? Will Sheridan. Afterwards, Jay's like, you know, we should have put you in that photo shoot, da da da. And I'm like, I'm not worried about a coach. I'm gonna get mine. Yeah, right. And he was like, you know, like think about that in the context of now NIL and visibility yeah. and having likes <clears throat> and things like that. So for me, I always but also, was different. I was but- always the outsider. But also, I would think a lot of people in your shoes would think that you were excluded on purpose. Sure. So a, a lot person of things not, happen to me. Not comfortable a lot of things, with themselves. Yeah. Well, a lot, you know, I those thoughts have happened, right? Okay. Imposter syndrome also kicks in, right? Mm-hmm. For example, on a year where Villanova basketball is not the greatest, right? All of a sudden, I'm the alumni of the year. And I was like, oh, this sucks. Like, nobody's like, you know, it's not a vibe. We're not like winning the national championship. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, actually, this is a reflection of my character, and my commitment to the community and the family. So, like, if you just sit and think about stuff sometimes, like, you're going to sabotage your happiness right. unless right. you really just think about it. Like, and so for me, I didn't think like I was excluded because of whatever. I just, of those players, I was the person that probably was maybe least talented or whatever. I, all I know is I started all four years. I'm top 10 in blocks, you know, blah, 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 blah. Run yeah. by, 
Where are me and my and, and, and you're in the top 20 in rebounds. I, I know. We do our due diligence here. I don't know if you understand. <laughs> well, you know. we, we, are, are, we are professional journalists, just to remind you. <laughs> we are pros, just uh, so you know. You know so what? They said was, what there's was. a 50 retired in the fin, and it's not mine. So much respect <laughs> to everybody that's way better than me at basketball. I'm just a great that's person. That's funny. Yep. Uh, well, that is true. That is very true. Let me ask you this. So, you know, every when you went out and you, and you talked to your teammates, they all kind of knew what was up with you, right? As far, oh, as far I'm a whole as, weirdo. So the I mean, only guy that didn't know is coach, right? Sure. How, well, well, that's what he said. I mean, I, I, I think, I think, and I'm and I'm wondering how is that possible if if everybody on the, the squad knew, but Coach Wright didn't know. Well, he never heard it from my mouth, right? So that's what okay. he was referring to, right? But also as a parental figure, as a authoritarian, as the head of the basket, he was doing the most, <laughs> right? We yeah. we were still practicing in Nevin. We didn't have a, right. oh, a I know. elite deal. He wasn't worried about right. who I'm sleeping with. Yeah. But also, I think he trusted I was going to make good decisions because I never gave him a reason not to. I mean, while right. I was at Villanova, I was dating a 1L at Penn Law for three years. Right. And that's not security and like consistency. And like, I wasn't out here like, Running through the streets doing whatever yeah, I those mean, people do. Like, you know, yeah, well, I people was, don't know. I Will. Was I mean, you were so, you were the you were the picture of a, what a Villanova player is supposed to be. You you were orientation leader two years, right? I was. Thank you John. you wrote you wrote articles for the Philadelphia Inquirer. You know, you had like a diary that you kept for the Philadelphia Inquirer. You you had the spoken word things that you went to. You were involved yeah. with all the campus Talent activities. Shows, Not, you know, you had MC, great the grades. Sitting smart president guy. at the university. Thanks, Chuck. You know, yeah, you know, so you're those... you're you're a good citizen. So why would he be concerned you know right. i mean but also at the same time a villanova basketball player needs to be focused and not trying to be orientation counselors <laughs> oh that's that's Coach right it's like I mean, in your free time this is what you want to do i'm like yes again i just needed to feel a part of i needed to feel all four years of college i needed yeah for me it's about experience it's about living it's about existing and now because i've done all those things it's about being visible it's about telling my story over and over yeah. it's about connecting to people making sure that they have their proximity to somebody like me so that every day i just wake up and like <laughs> i leave the house and it's like i got to exist for another well listen person. i got to tell you that that's one of the most endearing qualities about you will i mean we're at the game you're cheering and yelling. I always, we always sit in the same section. We may not sit together, but we're always in the same section. We're in the alumni section, right? We yeah. always get aisle seats. Thank you, uh, Arlisha. Um, Arlisha. <laughs> so shout out to her. <laughs> so I mean, so the the best part about it is you're positive all the time, even when things around you get a little crazy sometimes. Especially over the last two seasons, it's been rough waters for a little bit for the Wildcats, but. I think that's why they they talked to you about and they gave you the award was because of you know you went to I don't know how many games you were at every time I went you seemed to be at the game, um, but sure. you know so you know you were correct on some of that but I'm not always positive. Let me tell you when I'm not positive when these new Villanova fans that only have been following us since these two championships yeah start. My thing is. You're not going to go at my family. Like, we're at this school. Yeah. Like, these guys on the court right now. Yeah. I would do anything for. So, yeah. stop personally attacking them. This doesn't warrant feedback. So, that's what actually I had to focus this year on not directing my energy to people. So, I just no, wanted I to focus it. on the game. But, yeah, I think, I think what we have is so special. And people would die to be a part of something like that, right? They would pay to be a part of something like that. Um, and I just follow my instincts and ended up in a good situation. Yeah. And so I've got to make the most of it every time and try to represent. And I think that is why coach just never questioned my character. Because I feel like in 2003, like if someone said you were gay, like it questioned your character, right? Like they the only the only images they have are what has been fed to us so right he never questioned my character so he never really had to 
in a bad way into my sexuality and also yeah. it kind of made it more of a professional environment right yeah now i do think back sometimes he was saying stuff and i'm like what are you talking about like He's like, enough with your laissez-faire shit. I'm oh, sorry, you're not curse. <laughs> yeah, and you're good. You're good. I'll, I'll do that, and then it'd be coach, right? Um, and I, and I've heard, I'm I've like, heard a couple of those stories. Well, like, you, you know, about he you, said some stuff. Yeah, laissez-faire. What do you mean? Twinkle Is toes, a, I think, was a word he used. What? You know? I heard twinkle toes was a word that he used when you were Did doing some that? kind of. I do run like something. a deer though, and I'm from Bear. I, oh, I've, I've seen you. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> But, you know, all those things, everything I've ever been insecure about, I just own it. And I think I ran faster than all the other big men because I ran on those. So 100%. 100%. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I was different for sure. And I think um, I think my team, I think that was the first time I had a day in and day out experience that was year round where I was a part of something that felt like that type of family, right? I have my own family, yeah. I have my cousins, I have my siblings, I have my parents, but like that was <clears throat> freshman year, adversity, trenches, and mm -hmm. then success. And no one can take that away. How about when you made the announcement, you know, you you did the article with Dana O'Neill, right? Mm -hmm. Who's been on the show. Mm -hmm. And then you were on, I remember seeing you on ESPN mm -hmm. and, and the whole thing uh, came out. Did you? What was the response from some of the not the basketball alumni so much because I know what that was, but w did you get any negative responses from Villanova in general as far as the alumni go and some of the events that we that we attend as basketball alums? Did anybody you know give you a hard time or did they just the kind of shun? I don't want to use the word shun, but you know yeah. what? I For context, um, I was working at Ralph Lauren. I still I still feel like my image was still very crisp and suits and clean shaven or big beard. the fashion plate as most of your teammates referred to me uh as you as you know i mean i heard that from more than one guy that you set trends you know i and love that they said that but uh <laughs> i i was just you know whatever cultured but anyway um at that time, I literally got into a black car from the Rhinelander mansion at Ralph Lauren to go to the studio to do the interview and come right back. So that's why you see me. I have like I feel like I have an ascot on or something like that. Yeah, something. So yeah. 2011, and, and a lot of my NGBA brothers and sisters, that's in that's National Gay Basketball Association, told me that you know they looked on the camera and they saw somebody that looked like them, but really I was still cultivating who I was. So I never felt Chuck. I never felt that shunned or like marginalized because i yeah. came out but then when i was becoming like the radical queer rapper with the like yeah platinum hair that went to purple with the long braids that went to the, the ground long braids, people just yeah, didn't yeah. know what to do with me they were like what what are you what is this like who is this right. person and, and i think that was an era where i was just like f everybody i'm gonna do what feels right yeah. for me and if you don't F with it, you don't F with it. And I hated a lot of it because I I really wish I could just like snap my finger and look normal and then snap my finger yeah. and be back. But I was heavy in Brooklyn. Like no oh, other basketball player in college basketball has ever been a culture creator and the most epicenter, like post hipster movement queer radical like entertainment like i was at the forefront of that so right i just had to do me and now I'm yeah back. <laughs> i yeah i remember i remember that i mean seeing you and it was a different hairstyle all the time it was a different you know look every oh. time i saw you and and you know and it's your create your creativity was off the charts even at school some of the things that you that you wrote you know the spoken word stuff and and the uh, the stuff in the Inquirer was awesome, you know. And in fact, I'm going to tell you right now, and I, I don't think you know this. You inspired CJ to go into uh, journalism and to be a. Oh an, wow! Yeah, he, he had some stuff published, you know, because uh, because of what you did. So that's awesome. You, you, yeah, you had touched you had touched a bunch of people, man. And so, what made you decide to go that route of, in the entertainment and being an MC? And is it is it just you yeah. know? your personality that you you wanted to you know get people yeah. involved or is it something that you you had a love for music and wanted to take it in that direction 
Yeah, so I love music, but um, I moved to New York to be a journalist. I wrote for The Source magazine, um, and I kind of got marginalized into this, like, oh, you're going to do this little fashion column and ghostwrite for this yeah. person and this person. That was weird. But I realized that, like, rap at that time was, like, Wale, Drake, um, J. Cole was kind of popping, Kendrick Lamar was popping, you know, Kid Cudi after that. Kanye was very conscious. It was just, like, the bars were there, but none of it was reflecting my life. So I felt like I needed to rap. And yeah. so I started doing that, and um, then I realized that there was no space. Once my music got good enough, there was no space to perform. So I created the space. So I created the music. I created the, I didn't create the lane, but I got in the lane. Created the music, created the space, found out that I was good at event producing. Then I needed to host it too because it needed the energy and to connect to the people that my intersectionality would promote it because every, like, daddies love me, athletes love me, these people love me, these people, they're all going to come to the show. So all of that became a brand and it became like, why not make money from this, right? So yeah, right. I started doing that and um it just went it went it went crazy. And then I ended up working for a production company, AO production, and um event production is just like curating events and vibes is something I'm good at. So I try to keep that always um in the fold of what I do for work. But you went all over the world with that though, Will, right? I did. What, what I were some um, of the craziest places you've been to to perform? Uh, Bearheim in Berlin opens up on Thursday night and closes on wow. Tuesday morning. I don't know if that's going to put them in a trouble thing, but you know, whatever. Um, I really love Toronto, Vancouver, Portland, Montpellier, France. I didn't even know what that was before I went there. Right. And it was a, um, the theme of the festival was like sex. And I was just like, it was some stuff going on there. You know, just a lot of places. Yeah. Um, also, just because of who I am, like, I got to go to Kenya, and that was awesome, and, like, do music there for the kids. Um, for me, when I look back, like, I didn't sell the most records. Right. I had the most impact, right? And now you see, like, like the fruits of my labor and other queer artist labor so that you can have what you have now right and if you have that then you can have this so everything exists it seems um, to be your mo because you were you were part of the cornerstone for the the culture at villanova you know and now here you are same thing in in this uh, in this culture as well and now i work in diversity equity inclusion at a commercial insurance company in wayne pa so <laughs> <laughs> wait for that brand that brand yeah. shift coming next. Stay tuned. Yeah. So, all right. So let's get Will, back. Let's get, go ahead, son. Is there any pressure being put on you to represent or, you know, be a poster for this or anything like that? Is there any, any of the organizations trying to use you to forward, you know, an agenda? That's a good yeah. question. Um, I, as you can tell, I'm always going to do what feels right for me. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah, I got um, that. I've been approached to tell my story for lots of reasons, right? And I only do things that are aligned with what I feel is part of my brand. Um, I personally have an agenda to be visible because I think if you have a queer child, you will want them to be like me and confident so they don't like, yeah, know, right? That is the that is the agenda, right? Is to have positive influences of people who are human that you could just like relate to. But what gets confused now with politics, and we don't have to go heavy into that, but what gets confused is we pick these polarizing things and we're like, kids can't see that, blah, 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 blah. And like it's just, bro, I grew up like, come on, Oz was on, like it. <laughs> Yeah, Before right. The internet, like it, they're gonna find it anyway. But right. that's a whole other thing. But so I think, and I also think that I didn't fall in love with hoops until after I played. So my brand is all over the place, right? So not one singular entity can use me right. as an example, like you know, out sports or National Gay Basketball Association or the gay games. They love me, but like, I don't care about 
<laughs> wins and losses that they're like they can't i'm not the most competitive i, I have right. nothing to prove in that lane right so they can't use me as the poster boy and then like people that do these like flash in the pan politics for like clicks they would never approach me because no. i'm way too like like they are getting they would have to pay me a lot of money to be a fool <laughs> right, right right and it would and it would be so visible it'd be Chuck would be like, oh, you're acting different. I saw that interview you did. That, that doesn't seem like you. And that's just never going to be me, right? Right, right. Um, I did the Love and Hip Hop um, auditions and got to the finals and blah, 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 blah. And they're like, you're just not toxic enough. So I couldn't be on TV. It's fine. It wasn't for me. Where I'm at right now is exactly where I'm supposed to be. Wow. Well, that's Some great. in their own skin, man. Yeah, I, I mean, what's better than that, you know? I By mean, definition, yeah. Yeah. That's a healthy mental health perspective, though. It took a lot of work, and I do. I bet it did. And hats off to you. therapy. In wow. college, sophomore year through senior year, three days a week. No wow. lie. That's the health department. I have the health services or whatever that building was called before. Oh, really? It was a billion-dollar campus. I wow. used to go tuesday wednesday friday monday tuesday thursday like i was wow. in there talking it out and then that's just we created a habit of when i became an adult because i went through we could talk forever and i know you got time but, yeah um when i moved to new york and the freedom of being becoming who you are and then being around a community you got to think for 14 years I was in New York, 10 of those years I was in this bubble like Peter Pan where I don't get older, I don't have to interact with procreators. I like I was like my mind was just like yeah. clear radical politics and like art and like so you know, I was going through a lot of transitions at the time and that really cultivated who I am as a adult now. So wow. I don't know what we're talking about, but it doesn't yeah, seem yeah. like Biggie's I mean, basketball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. It's all good. I, I do have one more basketball question for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we didn't really talk much about this. What was your relationship like with, with Jay, and and what's it like today? Are you still close with him? Is it, was, you know, what did he mean to you back then and, and now currently? All right, so let me just preface this by saying I'm answering this as the fully actualized adult that overanalyzes everything, <laughs> right? Okay. So if you think about, first of all, Coach Ray is literally programmed in my phone as Coach Ray. He will be ever forever be Coach Ray. I come sure. from a great pedigree of Stan Waterman in high school and Coach Ray in college. Like two stand-up guys yep. know the game, you know, Stan respect, they, you know, whatever, right? Both parental figures. Um, Coach Wright is the same, always. He's never changed on me. He's never did anything fake. He's did his thing. I've done my thing. I think we're both stars, right? Coach Wright is a December Capricorn. I'm a January Capricorn. Now, if you know, December Capricorns are like the real leaders and like they really can like lead people and motivate them. And then January Capricorns are like, the face. So whatever Coach Wright says, I'm going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> he literally was like, he gave me some professional, he gave me some professional um, advice when I was transitioning back to Delaware and I will forever thank him for that. And he's always just, he's always just been so encouraging and Patty is just so supportive and, you know his children i love them so like everything he ever had as far as success or that he brought to villanova i was 100 percent behind and super proud of and that is the energy i bring to the games when we're losing by 12 in the first half and they're booing on the main line i'm like you don't even know. But yeah, I, I love Coach Wright. I think I truly believe he loves me back. Um, it's a mutual respect. And, you know, I feel like, you know, he, feel, he feels like he was a little hard on me in college. And maybe he was. But again, like I said before earlier in an interview, I don't know how the edit's going to go. If anybody could take it, no diddy. Yeah. I could take it. Yeah. Well, 
Listen, what a great way to wrap this up. We're up against it, Will. I really, truly appreciate you coming out here and hanging with us tonight. Um, learned a lot about you and about your character. I knew I knew before we even had you come on what kind of guy you are. But, uh, man, it, it, it's, so, it's so refreshing to see somebody that's so comfortable with themselves as a person mm -hmm. and, uh, and doing the things that you do for numerous communities, not just the uh, LGBTQ. Yeah. Uh, you know thank you it it really is and uh you know i appreciate you and i can't wait to uh get to summer jam and hang out with you some more we always That's have gonna a, be great and, yeah we always have a good time you know and with chef too it's funny because i you know i remember um back when i was kind of like where you are alumni wise and there was a couple older guys that would come out and they would be the guys taking everybody around and stuff. And I'm like, Hey, wait a minute. When did I become the old guy? You know? So it was, uh, it's kind of, it's kind yeah. of, you know, so I, I enjoy it. I enjoy your company. I enjoy you. And thanks again, very, very much for coming on and, uh, and joining us here on the big East rewind. Appreciate you, man. Stunning, thanks, Chuck. Man. Thank you so much. For yep. sure. Hang out Appreciate for a minute. It. Let me close this up and we'll, yeah. uh, we'll talk some more. You've been listening to the Big East Rewind with Sonny Sparra and Chuck Everson. The Big East Rewind is produced and directed by Nick Chico Chorus and Daryl Gurney. Check us out on all things social media by putting Big East Rewind in the search bar and on our website at www.bigeastrewind.com. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share it with your friends. Thanks a lot for joining us. Have a great night.